It is my um, great pleasure to introduce the next panel, um, which, as a student of urban planning, I'm particularly excited about myself, um, <laughs> entitled Imagining Spaces of Return and Mapping Palestinian Liberation. Now, we're joined today for the panel um, by uh, moderator Professor Salim Tomari, as well as panelists Linda Kikiewicz, uh, Ainat Manov, and Professor Thomas Abboud. Um, so, um, Salim Tamari is the Institute for Palestine Studies Senior Fellow and the former director of the IPS Affiliated Institute of Jerusalem Studies. He is editor of, um, of Jerusalem Quarterly, Quarterly and Hawlit Al Quds. He is professor of sociology at Birzeit University and an adjunct professor at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University. He has authored several works on urban culture, political sociology, biographer, biography, and social history, and the social history of the Eastern Mediterranean. Recent publications include Year of the Locust, Palestine and Syria during World War I, Ihsan's War, The Intimate Life of an Ottoman Soldier, Biography and Social History of Bilad al-Sham, Pilgrims, Lepers, and Stuffed Cabbage, Essays on Jerusalem's Cultural History, Reinterpreting the Historical Records, the Uses of Palestinian Refugee Archives for Social Science, Research, and Policy Analysis, and finally, Mountain Against the Sea, Palestine's Unfulfilled Modernity. Professor Tamari is currently a visiting professor at Harvard University. Um, first, and then uh, of the panelists, the first to be speaking will be Linda Kikiewicz. Linda Kikiewicz is an Andrew W. Mellon postdoctoral fellow in critical global humanities at Brown's Kogut Center. Her work critically examines the constructions of maps and borders in the modern era. Of central is interest to her work is how people struggling for autonomy from a regime, nation state, or other, full, other powerful social system contest dominant spatial arrangements and create new ones. She took her doctorate in geography from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2012. Following will be Einat Manov um, with a paper entitled Countermapping and the Geographical Imagination, Mapping Spatial Scenarios of Return. And I apologize, um, Linda Kikivik's paper will be entitled Liberation or Independence, Palestine as Land or Palestine as Territory. So uh, back to the biography of Einat Manov. Um, Einat is an urban designer and a scholar activist whose research focuses on participa participatory methods and theories, including participatory action research, PAR, community-based planning and countermapping. Working with these inclusionary approaches, she collaborates with communities to promote local-based action and research around planning for justice. Enat is currently a PhD student in the Environmental Psychology Program at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. She teaches geography and urban affairs at the, at the CUNY colleges. She is a 2012-2013 Urban Fellow at the Public Science Project. Uh, finally, we'll have panelist uh, Thomas Abboud with, uh, presenting a paper entitled The Return of Homes and the Restitution of History in Jerusalem. Thomas Abboud teaches in the Department of Anthropology at Tufts University. He has been involved for two decades in scholarly and activist projects related to Palestine, Israel, and the Middle East. He is the author of the upcoming book, Colonial Jerusalem, The Spatial Construction of Identity and Difference in a Divided City. Thomas is also the author of National Boundaries, Colonized Spaces, The Gendered Politics of Residential Space in Contemporary Jerusalem. He is at work on a study of racial politics in Detroit that details Arab American and black class, racial, and gendered encounters. He has been awarded a Fulbright Fellowship to do research in Jerusalem, Palestine in 2012. Please join me in welcoming our next panel. Uh, thank you, Alex. The um, title of this panel is Imagining Space of Return, and we have uh, three very interesting uh, presentations which address uh, practical issues of return in the imaginatory and reconceptualization of ways we have been thinking about mapping uh, discourse databases uh, such as the UNCCP, and also a, a practical uh, visitation uh, procedures. I'm, I'm very lucky and unlucky not to have received the papers today, so I can imagine what the speakers would say. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I have enough knowledge of the speakers, so what I will say uh, will might uh, highlight, but also will have to be uh, readjusted after the papers are given. Um, uh, Linda Kivkivex, 
makes a very provocative statement about how scholarship activism and political practice unwittingly hinder the road to liberation. She makes a distinction between uh, notions of liberation and independence, which I think would be fleshed out in her notions of mapping. She attacks or she criticizes um, conventional mapping in order to introduce ways in which indigenous local knowledge has been rethinking about public space and private space and how people have been mapping their own imagery of Palestine. Uh, and we will see some of this uh, on the wall in a minute. Uh, so the, the, the main theme of this uh, issue is alternative mapping of Palestine in the imagery of refugees. Um, Inat Manoff, who is engaged with a group that I highly admire in Israel called Zohorot, um, mentions of return as a very abstract notion. And also, like Kiki, um, is considering notions of counter-mapping in the geographical imagination. Uh, these counter-mapping exercises are actually involved in practical visitations to sites which either do not exist now or have been uh, obliterated from the physical map in order to be brought about to life by actual practices of visitation. And this is something we'll hear about in a minute. And last but not least, uh, Tom Aboud, uh, addresses the issues of West Jerusalem property um, in the construction of refugee identity. Uh, he will um, address, I, I suspect, uh, the whole issue of the use of UNCCP records, which we heard about in the last session, am I correct? And uh, in order to see how uh, the official understanding of restitution can be different from practical um, uh, direct notions of restitution. This is something I am personally very interested in and I hope to make uh, some uh, 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 comments about it uh, at the end in terms of the use and abuse of uh, UNCCP records. So without further ado, I will introduce the speakers. Thank you so much to the organizers, especially for putting on this conference and for all of you for attending. Um, I think I'll begin uh, my presentation by addressing something that occurred yesterday. I made a, uh, I, I, set, I put forth a question to a panelist yesterday on whether the, the fight for indigeneity was a wise one in that in Israel-Palestine, something really interesting is that the colonizer makes claims to indigeneity and the world believes them more than they do the Palestinians, or at least the world of those institutions above. And uh, I was asked afterward by a lot of people if I could expand on that notion, and it wasn't so much on uh, the question of indigeneity that I was worried about, but more about the question of sovereignty. And I brought as, uh, to the attention of the panelists and people who asked me later the, the ways of organizing of other movements for liberation in the past and in the present, bringing, uh, uh, highlighting the Black Panther Party in that for the black, the, for, for the black condition in the Western Hemisphere, but arguably also in Africa, the question of sovereignty is an impossible question because there is no place where people can point to having been from. 
having been disembedded from Africa, from their history, they have no access of time and space that can, that can be legible for the kind of politics that the world uh, deems proper. The Black Panther Party in the 1960s and 70s takes up this question after so many attempts for black people to make claims to black nationalism, to sovereignty, and, say, and said it is an impossibility, so we need to create the world completely differently. The Zapatistas today are saying the same thing, even though they are confused by so many people who don't know what they're doing as an indigenous rights movement, they refuse to be thought of as an indigenous rights movement. They do not seek to make claims for indigeneity, they seek to make claims for autonomy, for self-determination, and they make a very strong distinction between sovereignty and self-determination, seeing them as opposed rather than conflated. And I wanted to bring that up to set up my talk in talking about how this tension between sovereignty and self-determination seems to manifest itself within the Palestinian movement as well, uh, in the tension between independence and liberation, which is what the movement has talked about for a really long time. So um, what I'll do is I will look at the way that investigating the history of mapping Palestine can, can point to this and maybe point toward creative ways forward. Now, it's a conceptual intervention, but because it focuses so much on the role of power, it asks in our, in our concept of power that we understand other ways of exercising power in order to open up a space for the practical implementation of the right of return. Um, I begin with the premise that our conceptions of space are bound to the politics that we adopt. And what I want to do is look at, if that's true, what our reliance on the use of maps in, when we, in thinking about the conflict and any potential solution um, um, has us think about what political power is like. Because in the history of mapping Palestine in the, in the modern era, maps have been used as tools for dispossession. It's a history of colonialism. And so then I want to make two points on this. One is that one is spatial, and one is, one is at the level of space, and one is at the level of power. At the level of space, the point I want to make is that modern mapping practices create space as an object for control from above. And at the political, at, at, the, at the level of power, a related point that I want to make is that the production of space as an object to be ruled over also produces a relation of domination, of sovereignty, rather than one of self-determination. And I will tease that out uh, very briefly before beginning. What I want to say about the relation of sovereignty is that it's a relation of domination obedience. It does not fully allow us to truly collectively determine our lives. Its greatest myth is that we cannot act as creative actors. The only relation of power that it allows us is one of victim, where we are acted upon, or one of protester, where we act against. It doesn't allow for this creative relation. For the Palestine case, I find the, the production of space uh, within this tension um, maybe usefully understood as a distinction between the production of territory, this object of sovereign control, uh, pitted against maybe Palestinian conceptions of Palestine as land, which is much harder for me to describe to you because it, it may be that it's it's not just not so easily seen as the way that territory is on a map. So um, I'll begin very briefly by just orienting us. Um, we know we're in the Middle East and North Africa, circa 2000, 21st century. These are the, the borders. Uh, I want to point out that when Palestine and the area first started being mapped by the West, those borders didn't exist. Uh, the Ottoman Empire in uh, 1800, uh, was not so worried about territory in the modern sense, but what was important territory or territorial control was trade routes, and that included the seas. Um, but then we get um, 
Here, our area of focus, Palestine, we get its borders in 1923, and this is kind of how we begin the story with, with uh, historic Palestine. Uh, the set of maps that we're all used to is this one, uh, the UN partition, the armistice lines, the Six-Day War, noticing that now we have the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights, the Camp David Treaty, where we no longer have a Sinai uh, in our mental map, but we do the Golan and the West Bank and Gaza. When we get to the peace process, even though the Golan Heights is still occupied, it's not in our mental maps. And this signals that shift for so many Palestinian intellectuals uh, of, from liberation to independence, where now the movement is just so isolated and concentrated on, 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 on a status kind of project, and what it has done is it has removed from our mental map the Golan Heights, but not only that, but you know, looking at this incredibly powerful map, um, which is so dominant in the way that we think about Israel-Palestine in its sequence, right? Um, a critique I'd like to put forward of this map uh, and, and I don't want to say that we should not use it. I think that we absolutely should. It's incredibly good. But a critique is, uh, in its dominance, what we lose is talking about how Palestine is not just about Palestine. We don't have, again, the Golan Heights. We don't have even references to neighboring countries, Egypt, Jordan, uh, Lebanon, Syria. We don't... We don't have references to where Palestinians are. We don't have the Palestinians of Israel on this map. You would, you, you, would, you would come to think that this is really just a conflict about territory rather than the link of Palestinians and Palestine, wherever that might be. So in the history then of uh, Palestine's mapping, modern mapping, and by, by that what I mean is the measurement of space in an accurate way so that it can be known by an external power, by people who don't live there. People who live there don't need maps. It's a history um, of warfare, of, 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 of a biblical crusade in the 19th century, then as a, of one of bounding land, bordering land and then uh, a, a cadaster of private property. So beginning with, um, back to the Eastern question when the Ottoman Empire did not have borders, we get here, I mentioned earlier, that the that territorial control, which included the seas, was important. And so we get the first mapping of Palestine, the first modern mapping or triangulation measurement on the ground by Napoleon's cartographers, uh, circa 1800, and it's a map for warfare. Um, here you can see, it was, it was a map of Egypt and the Eastern Mediterranean in the Encyclopedia of Egypt. And what this map was for, it's such a really great, great case study to show that societies make maps only when maps call for them, and the map that, that Napoleon's army was calling for was one of uh, ground and coastal, a naval and ground warfare. Because as you can see, here's a, here's a sheet for Gaza. The coasts are uh, impeccably, impeccably measured. They're really great. They're really accurate. Uh, and there's also topography. So it's for naval and ground warfare. They didn't go inland. But here is the sheet for Jerusalem and Jaffa. And again, the coasts uh, and the terrain along the coasts are pretty accurate. But again, they did not go inland, but they wanted to include Jerusalem anyway. And you can kind of see the, the um, little caterpillar mountains uh, more inland. They were just, they're not accurately measured. This was a map for, again, naval and ground warfare. Then you get the Crusader, Crusader map, or the Neo-Crusader maps of the 19th century, where you had biblical scholars taking the Bible literally as a historical document and wanting to prove it as fact. And you get, uh, in this case, the Palestine Exploration Fund's map of Western Palestine that wanted to bound for the first time in modern history the borders 
of the promised land, from Dan up north in Benyas to Beersheba, down in the south. And this map was created under the guise of science and religion, but was created by the British War Office, largely because they needed a map. They were trying to protect the Ottoman Empire from having more incursions from Russia and from other European powers. This map um, was the most accurate map of Palestine for the next 50 years, and it was a map that Allen B. used to capture Jerusalem 50 years later, Jerusalem as a gift to the British people, as Lord George requested. Um, here is one sheet, and I'll just zoom in. Um, to show here is Bethlehem. And what was important was, of course, the religious sites. They were trying to prove that these religious events actually took place. Um, but also, you have the mapping of roads. This was a military map, as much as it was a scientific and a religious map. Uh, next, you get the bounding of the area. Here's our, our Sykes-Picot map. And this, I want to point out, is not at all unique to the area. This was, this was just the logic of the time. Here is the partition uh, or the carving up scramble for Africa. Oh, before I move on, what I want to say, something that's really interesting about having this logic of lines, of carving up the world in lines, is a very, very new phenomenon in, in modern thinking, largely uh, one brought, up, brought, brought by colonialism. The first time lines were discussed in treaties was a treaty of Tordesillas between the Portuguese and the Spanish who wanted to carve up the new world, the Americas, between them. And so this is the line then that then creates Brazil and then the Spanish-speaking South America. This logic then comes to other parts of the world, including Europe, whereas territory in Europe was not understood as a homogeneous chunk of earth bounded with lines. It was understood as a, lace, uh, as a list of places, not unlike the Ottoman Empire um, it had uh, different conceptualizations of territory. Going back to that Palestine Exploration Fund map, which was the most accurate map of, of Palestine until the British mandate, here is a, a, a zoomed in shot of it, and then 50 years later, the same area by the British survey that wanted to create Palestine into even smaller chunks of delineated lines of pro private property. So you see now you have these lines where they did not exist before. Um, this was part of a private property land settlement project um, initiated in a lot of ways by the Zionist movement so that they, can le that they could legally purchase land. But it was also initiated by the British themselves as they were doing in so many parts of the world. They wanted people to become, dis to discipline themselves into seeking assistance with the courts and judges and the police over territorial disputes and other, any other kinds of disputes. Whereas, um, Previously, many times, borders were decided upon between neighbors. It's that tree to that tree. That was a social relation where people actually talk to each other to figure things out. When you get the private property mapping, the cadastro mapping, and the juridical political conception of space, you now have to go to the courts to settle these kinds of things. And this is an outside, unaccountable party. What's so interesting about the history of these maps, though, that rarely gets talked about is the resistance in their production. Now, as we see here, by 1948, this was the area that the British managed to, to settle individual private uh, title to. Um, and, but so many areas refused it, and especially the areas that had the Masha, the common lands, where there was not one individual owner. There were the, the village, the, the village was the owner in a lot of ways. And you notice here that it kind of resembles what the armistice lines would, right? And in fact, when the logic of partition was introduced under the Peel Commission, the Peel Commission, which absolutely detested the common lands, the Mishah system, um, understood that the 
peasants were holding onto it, refusing to allow it to be titled for individual property and to be mapped because they were trying to guard themselves from, from uh, Jewish land uh, purchases. So here is an actual quote from the Peel Commission. In certain areas, the Arabs regard the system, the masha, of tenancy, destructive as it all is of development, according to the British, as a safeguard against alienation. Uh, in other words, through the sale to immigrant Jews, and that the administration had been reluctant for political reasons to abolish it by legislation. So a really important reason why the British were not, uh, not able to, um, uh, to, to, to settle these areas was because they were afraid of the Palestinians. Uh, moving on really quickly, um, uh, in pointing out to then uh, these kinds of practices, these exercises of power from below, what I want to point to is how Palestinians used the map, like so many anti-colonial movements did, as a logo to rally around. But what's so interesting about them is that if you see this poster, an early PLA poster, uh, you also have uh, icons of armed struggle and women and children, a popular struggle, not just a territorialist struggle. And also in logos, Fatah and the um, PFLP, you have the map. In Fatah, you have the uh, you have armed struggle is important, and then for PFLP, you have the return. Also, Yasser Arafat, his kafia, supposedly it took an hour for him to fix it this way, <laughs> according to one biographer. Um, by the 1980s, you get a really, you start getting really sophisticated cartography of Palestine by Palestinians. This is um, a, a map that took five years, 1983 to 88, to be completed. And you notice the legend, it continues calling, first of all, it maps all of historic Palestine, but it also calls Jewish areas settlements, mm -hmm. not cities, not towns, but settlements. By the time you get to the peace process, though, only a few years later, this is the frame that the Palestinian negotiators use to map. And what's so interesting about it is that it, it, in, in questions, for example, of Jerusalem, uh, it's, um, it's, it's impossible. I would, I would submit. It's impossible. Here is um, a frame by which just uh, the negotiators maybe use, and it even includes East Jerusalem in the, in the West Bank. And if you notice, Jerusalem is um, theoretically like modern maps on Cartesian plane. They take um, Jerusalem, they take all areas to be of equal value and of equal importance. And if you look at the font size of Jerusalem and Ramallah and Tel Aviv Yafo and Tulkara, the font size is exactly the same, right? This is, in, this is completely different from pre modern conceptions of space, sacred space of Jerusalem, where this was the map of Jerusalem. And not just the map of Jerusalem, but the map of the world. Jerusalem was the center of the world. And you have the three continents, Europe, Asia, and Africa. This is a late medieval map where you, you have the Americas also because they just figured them out. But they didn't really know what to do with them because the Bible never said anything about it. right? Uh, and what's so interesting about it is that in the negotiations, the Israelis will refuse to even talk about Jerusalem because it's too sacred. But you have Omer telling the Palestinian negotiation, well, it's only 0.04% of the West Bank anyway. So there, that tension reveals how Jerusalem, while trying to be forced into this conception of modern Cartesian space, into territory, is still too sacred and cannot be mapped in that way, right? Something really interesting is refugee counter cartography. This is on Google Earth, whereas in the negotiations on the left side, this is the, this is the acceptable frame, the yellow from wh where to map. The refugees don't pay attention to that. And they map inside 48. And this map, actually, when it first came out on Google Earth, um, using a lot of Salman Abu Sitta's work, it, um, was, it proved itself to be much more threatening than any map that the Palestinian negotiating team had ever made. It caused a lot of a scandal in Israel because the, the map became so popular. The person that made it, Thameen Darby, he was, he's a, he was always on the Google community. Um, and because he was, he was using Google Earth so much, and then he makes this map. Um, the, um, the Google Earth used to have like the best of the Google Earth community, 
and um, they featured it worldwide. And one of the towns where an Arab village was put on, a, a little pin on threatened to sue Google because of it. So again, much more threatening, much more antagonistic coming from below than from above. you have a question? Could you just say exactly what the, those red marks are? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, those marks are all uh, the, the, village, the 48 villages, the Palestinian 48 villages. And if you click on one of them, you get pictures, you get narratives, stories, oral histories. Yeah. Um, also in refugee camps, this is the map you see. You never see a map of the West Bank and Gaza, right? Um, so these are mapping practices from below that are just so frightening. I mean, this map has no authority on the ground, but it's incredibly powerful. It scares the Zionist movement so much more than any negotiating team maps do. Um, this is a really interesting project, Subjective Atlas of Palestine, in that um, coming from artists, you have various ideas of where Palestine is. And here is a map of where the refugees are scattered worldwide. That's Palestine. You also get this map of Ramallah put on top of the wall, showing its extremities. And here's another version of it. Uh, you have a dead end road on this side, a prison on this side, a settlement on the other side that the map just does not show you. What's interesting about Subjective Atlas is that it's mostly not maps. It's a lot of everyday life stuff and culture. And here is a Palestinian music collection. Here is garbage keeping Ramallah clean. Here's a letter from a prisoner to his mother telling her that I learned to, from prison, telling her I learned to read and write. That's Palestine too. Where they do have maps, they are fanciful and actually incredibly, incredibly sophisticated, I would argue, and I'll give you two examples. One is this bottom one here of, the, um, of Palestine on top and below. So this is, for me, this is kind of what A.L. Weitzman and others have written about any two-state solution would really create two states on top of each other, winding and warming, where Jews never have to see Palestinians connected through tunnels and bridges. And then another one is, uh, this is one of my favorite. This is, I, I want to write it, just uh, an entire essay on it. Um, because in a lot of ways, it's right. It, it, this is really just a game. Uh, that's, that's rigged in many ways in the number of possibilities that are allowed. Another project, and I'll wrap up with this one, is one that I've been working on in Ida refugee camp. Now, um, I went to uh, Ida refugee camp to just hang out with little kids, teach them art while they taught me Arabic. And then, they, then in the camp, Laji Center that I was working with found out that I was a geographer and they asked me if I could map the camp. And this was uh, when I was doing my dissertation research, the early, early parts of it. And, and, I, and I wanted to say, no, maps have ruined everything. Haven't you been paying attention to what I've been saying? <laughs> but what was really great is that we had these really in, awesome conversations together about, of course, the dangers of mapping. Maybe the Israelis would get them. They say, well, the Israelis already have them. We don't have maps. And um, so then we talked about how do, we, how do we have this progressive emancipatory relationship to the map? Um, and, it's, and, it's, and, and, it, and it comes as we do it. And I'll give you an example of one. But just to set the, set the camp, um, here is, I managed to get a high-res aerial photograph of the camp that Israel took, the military took, that sold to private contractors, and then a Palestinian cartographer got it and gave it to me. Because on Google Earth, by the way, Israel is the only country that does not allow, is, is, it's banned to have high-resolution imagery of um, by US congressional decree. <laughs> Uh, so I had to get this from uh, other, other places. And so just to sit, so the wall is up at, on the top, uh, up, up there. And just more of a ground view version, here's the wall. And on the other side is the um, olive orchard that was stolen from the camp and then a settlement. And then you know, Jerusalem is that way. And Jerusalem is incredibly close. People will walk there. It takes less than an hour. Uh, but going back to it, here's the aerial photograph. Uh, we mapped the camp buildings, the streets, some trees, the wall, the black dots are the sniper towers, which in their size are very small, but in their reach they're very wide. So something that we'll map is the reach 
of the, of the bullets. Um, lifting out one layer. Here's, here's, here's the map that, with the one minute that I have left, I want to leave you with. Um, lifting out the one layer of the streets. This is a map that I traced, the professional cartographer with my GIS fancy geography software. And here are the streets, Ida streets. And I was showing them to uh, someone in the camp that I was working with, Nidal Al Azraq over there, who um, was helping me just make sure that I was tracing things correctly because the camp is so crowded, you know, you can't, can't see too much from the aerial photograph. Uh, and I was asking him, are the streets okay? And as he was looking at them, he said, you know, the rooftops are also streets. And I asked him to draw it. And the story, and he can tell you so much more, is this is how he sees the streets when you're under curfew and you will be shot at if you use the streets that the cartographer is telling you are there. He made his own streets from jumping building to building to building. Now for me, this is so important to recognize how the limitations of professionals, us, um, professional cartographers, I'm using myself as an example, have people who don't live in the area, right? This is why we need, we've needed maps so much because we don't know the area. And this is why they, they, they haven't really needed maps. I was showing one of the youth the map of the camp from above, and he says, and he couldn't orient himself. He's like, I've never seen the camp this way, uh, because he always sees it from below, from the alleys, from, from the rooftops, right? But then he said, oh yeah, I did see it one time. I saw it when I was arrested, and the Israelis asked me to point out my house, which is how they get their stuff. So I'll leave you with that, um, and then maybe we can talk some more in Q&A.